We're running out of IP addresses. Actually, we've been running out of IP addresses for quite a few years now. And NAT is a workaround constructed for this problem. Learning about this stuff will give you the much needed context you need when diving into WebRTC or P2P stuff. Okay, we know that NAT is related to IP addresses. So let's recap why we even need IP addresses in the first place in just one line. An IP address is a unique ID of your device on the internet or any network which ensures that anyone else can send data to you and only you instead of someone else. Now, what is NAT and how does it work? At its core, NAT is the method of mapping a private IP address to public IP address. This will make more sense in just a minute. Assume your entire household is connected to the internet via a router. In order to avoid assigning unique public IP addresses, which we're running out of, to each and every single one of your devices, what your router does is assign unique private IP addresses to each of the devices which is connected to your router. And your ISP will provide your router with a single public IP address, which is unique. Now, this way, we save a lot of IP addresses and all of your devices get the information they want because your router handles all the information which needs to reach those devices via these private IP addresses. Essentially, your entire household has a single IP address according to the rest of the internet, but your router assigns a private IP address to each of your devices, private because the outside world cannot reach it without first entering your router. And the process of mapping the private IP address to public IP address is NAT. This is the most basic explanation of NAT. But let's dive deeper. Whenever you send data through the internet, it travels as IP packets. Now IP packets have a lot of information in them which is separated into header, payload, footer and etc. Now headers, they contain a lot of information within them such as the from address and to address. And here's where NAT comes into play. Alright, so your mobile is connected to the router. Now when your mobile device gets connected to the router, it gets assigned a private IP address. You are trying to make a request to some server on the internet. Now let's say your private IP address is 192.168.0.1 and the application you're trying to make the request from is using the port 9899. When you send the request to the router to fetch some data from a server, let's say its IP is 8.8.8.8 and we're hitting the HTTPS port, so it's 443. So what happens here is very interesting. At this stage, what happens is the private IP address, which is currently present in the IP packet, gets replaced with the public IP address and your router handles this. Now why is this important? Because as mentioned, your private IP address cannot be reached without first other devices on the internet hit your router. When you hit the server, it knows where to send the data to. Your public IP address is the only thing visible to the rest of the world. And your router assigns a particular port for that request as well. So in this case, let's say it's 7700. An IP packet with the replaced from address header travels to the server and the server processes the information and sends requests back to the public IP address to your router. What happens here is the same thing but in reverse. It modifies the IP packet and replaces the destination address or the two address in the header to the private IP address of the mobile device which is connected to the router. And in this case it is 192.168.0.1 and it's supposed to reach support 9899. This private IP address to public IP address mapping is maintained within the router and this is called a NAT table and for our use case it is going to look something like this. Here's a more clearer explanation with multiple devices connected to a single router. Pause the video if you want to have a look at it. But here's an important thing to remember. Whenever you're making an outbound request, that is the only case where the NAT mapping gets created between the public IP address port to the private IP address and port. Now that we know how NAT works, let's see how it's traversed. Firewalls come into play here. Let's set some ground rules. NAT traversal techniques typically have to be UDP based. TCP can be used, but NAT is built on shaky ground. There's just too much complexity involved when TCP is to be used for NAT traversal. It's just best to remember that in general, it is UDP based. All right, firewalls. There are broadly two types of firewalls, which are the stateful firewalls and the stateless firewalls. The most common configuration for a firewall is to allow all outbound connections and to block all inbound connections with a few hand-picked exceptions such as SSH. Now this is a stateless firewall. Stateful firewalls on the other hand remember the packets that they've seen in the past and based on that make a decision on whether to allow or block new packets. For UDP the rule is very simple. The firewall allows an inbound UDP packet only if it has seen a matching outbound packet Let's say you and I are trying to communicate. The firewall will only allow packets which you're trying to send me if it has previously seen me 
trying to send a packet to you. Clear? Good. In a general scenario, to traverse NAT, a machine behind the firewall must be the one initiating the connections and the machine receiving these packets must accept all connections. So which means they essentially should not have strict firewalls which block new inbound connections. This is the only way to easily establish connections between two machines and this is the hub and spoke model which VPNs use. But what happens when two computers need to talk to each other directly but both of them are behind a firewall? As we've seen before, NAT mappings get created only when an outbound connection towards the internet requires it and in this case both of them can't know whom to speak to until the other side tells them to contact them in that particular public IP port combination so that they can start talking to each other. Now we have a classic deadlock. Quick note, apply the same thinking, but put it in the perspective of WebTorrent or WebRTC. Both of them are peer-to-peer -peer connections. Both these protocols suffer from the same problem. This is the reason truly P2P connections are just so difficult because NAT mappings need to get created in order for computers to start talking to each other directly. All right, we've seen the problem. Now let's move on to the solution, which is STUN. STUN used to stand for Simple Traversal of User Datagram Protocol, UDP, through Network Address Translators, NAT. These days, it's called Session Traversal Utilities for NAT. The functionality of a STUN server is so simple. So if your computer hits a STUN server, an outbound connection is made, a NAT mapping gets created, and the STUN server doesn't block it, it can receive the connection and see your public IP port combination. It sends this data back in the payload of the IP packet so that your router doesn't replace it in the header, which would make it kind of pointless, right? It sends your public IP port combination in the IP packet, and now you know where others can reach you. That's fundamentally what STUN protocol is. Your machine sends a what's my endpoint from your point of view, and the STUN server sends back exactly that. We figured out one part of the problem, that is knowing where to send and receive data. Now, the next part of the problem is to understand which connections to accept and which to not accept. That is the types of NAT. This is generally called as the security part of NAT. There are four types of NAT. We'll go through them right now. First, we have the full cone NAT, which is also called as the one-to-one -one NAT. And in this case, once a private IP address port combination gets mapped to a public IP address port combination, anyone on the internet can send data to the public IP address port combination and we'll just blindly accept it. Second, we have the address restricted cone NAT. Now in this case, if we have sent an outbound connection to that particular IP, any port on that IP can contact us through the NAT mapping that we've just created for ourselves. Third, we have the port restricted cone NAT. And in this case, it is exactly the same as address restricted cone NAT. The, the only difference being we can only receive packets from someone else if we've previously seen an outbound connection to that particular port and we can only receive data from that particular port from someone else. And fourth, we have the symmetric NAT. In this case, this is the most restricted type of NAT where a NAT mapping gets created based on the source address and the destination address. So let's say if we sent an outbound packet to someone on a particular port and destination from our internal address and port, we can only receive it if it arrives from that particular public IP address and port. Now let's say from the same internal IP address and port, we send it to someone else on the internet to a different IP that won't get accepted back because the NAT mapping is created based on our IP address, our internal IP address, as well as the external IP address. So in previous cases, if we used the same IP address port of our NAT mapping to send to someone else, we can receive connections. But in this case, even if the destination IP address changes, we just cannot accept it. We need to create a new NAT mapping for a different IP address. This is the case, even the stun server cannot save us because we'll be opening a connection to the stun server, not to someone else. Well, you can clearly see how this is a problem where we need to resort to something called as a turn server. I'll leave links below if you wanna read up more on that. Okay, that was dense, but now we have a clearer picture of how connections can be made between two machines directly over NAT. And this hopefully gives you more context about peer-to-peer -peer connections. There's just one more thing which we haven't covered and let's just get over this quickly, which is the problem of limited unique IP addresses. We do have a more permanent solution for that and that is called IPv6. With IPv6, we have so many IP addresses that billions seem small next to it. There's a term for how long it is and it is 340 undecillion unique IPv6 addresses. That is more than we're ever gonna need. With IPv6, there are two to the power 128 
unique IP addresses. The problem is we've built all our systems with IPv4 and we've been transitioning to IPv6 for almost 20 years now, a little close to 20 years, a little less than 20 years. In, with IPv4, we have a little shy of 4.3 billion unique IP addresses. If you want the exact number, you can just calculate what is 2 to the power 32. The world is actively moving to IPv6 as we speak, as AWS, the megacorp recently announced that they'll start charging for their IPv4 addresses. Oh, and fun fact, the IPv4 real estate that AWS owns is currently worth around $4 billion. And the craziest part, owning this real estate has appreciated in value by $2 billion in two years. Let that sink in. If you want to learn more, I've linked to all the resources that I used to make this video down below.